The wind. We've been capturing its energy for centuries, as is the case in this old classic Dutch windmill. This classic horizontal axis design has carried over into our current wind turbine design. The most notable change is we're now generating electricity and not milling grain. But unlike the old-fashioned windmill, we've gone ahead and put everything on top of a 250-foot tall tower. But the idea must be popular. Wind farms are sprouting all over and typically on flat level ground near major highways. Let's take a quick look at what's up there. Generator, pitch, yaw controls. Nothing much to go wrong here. Now let's take a look at a technician working his way up a 250 foot ladder to check out what may be a problem with the generator. And suppose the poor guy gets up there and he doesn't have the right tools or parts. Well, he might as well do a little sightseeing. It's a nice calm day. No turbines are spinning. But I better get that safety belt on just in case. Well, might as well enjoy the view. So why haven't wind farms utilized vertical axis wind turbines? They all share two major advantages over horizontal axis turbines. They are omnidirectional, meaning they can handle wind coming in from any direction without changes in speed or efficiency. And the generator and controls are at ground level. What a great idea. The problem is to get them up into the megawatt range, they'd have to be so tall they'd need to be supported by guide wires. Imagine a wind farm with a tangle of those. So why not a low profile vertical axis wind turbine with blades that extend outward? Well, that's just what I've put together in my proof of concept design. I've dubbed it the Aaron Turbine. In the next seven and a half minutes or so, we're going to take a 12 volt car battery that's been discharged down to 9.4 volts and charge it up to 11.6 volts. We had to stop there because the wind speed dropped to below a decent level for a continued charge, which probably would have taken another 15 minutes or so and I would have lost you all. You'll notice there is a voltage spike right after I connect the generator. That's because the chemical reaction in the battery hasn't quite kicked in yet. After a few seconds, it begins to draw current from the generator with the resulting voltage drop. I purposely did not edit these seven and a half minutes. There's no tricks, no scene fades, just some clumsy continuous video to prove the point. It's worth taking a moment here to explain the difference between a proof of concept device and a working prototype. Although this concept device held up quite well on a windy day out in the California desert, I wouldn't be able to place it in the test field at the National Wind Testing Center in Boulder with any confidence that it would hold together for a year, nor would they allow me on the property with it. It's going to take more money than I have at my disposal to get this to the working prototype stage. While the battery is charging, let's take a few minutes to describe just what I've got here. You may be surprised to know that it's homemade. The blades consist of a 2x4s with styrene plastic panels mounted to them to form a 50 degree leading edge. The tower is made of galvanized pipe held together with hose clamps. The drive shaft is a 1 half inch water pipe with an ATV hub welded to one end. The drive shaft is supported at top and bottom by a couple of front wheel bearings from a 1972 Mustang. The bicycle wheel and generator pulley are wobbly. 
because I'm just not good at that. A couple of more things are worth noting here. The belt pulley arrangement is a 7 to 1 ratio. The drive shaft spins at about 65 to 70 RPM. So the permanent magnet generator is spinning at close to 500 RPM. It's the best I could do with what I had, short of spending more money on a gearbox with a 15 to 1 gear ratio. You can see that the load on the generator hardly slows this thing down, so I'm comfortable with doubling the generator speed with a higher gear ratio. The plastic panels are 4 feet long and a foot wide. The 2x4s are 5 feet long. I velcroed a volt watt meter to the anemometer so you can see the direct relationship between the wind speed in miles per hour and the voltage current out of the generator. The meter on the battery confirms the voltage reading at the watt meter. The readings jump around a bit because the generator output will once in a while drop below the battery voltage depending on the changing wind speed and also because the generator output is unfiltered. So what's my vision here? For starters, unless you're on some acreage, wind turbines aren't great for the home market. This type of wind turbine will do best scaled up to commercial wind farm applications to bring the cost of gener generating electricity down to reasonable levels. Heck, it might even eliminate the need for some government subsidies. The flex panels are made of styrene plastic and they would be replaced by mill grade 304 stainless steel, about 30 thousandths thick. The 2x4s would be replaced by crane type triangular trusses, but with the leading edge of the truss set at a 50 degree angle in order to mount the stainless steel panels. The panels would be in sections about 10 feet long and 3 feet wide for ease of assembly and maintenance. The tower only needs to be about 15 feet high, so a utility bucket truck could handle assembly and maintenance without risking life and limb up a 250 foot tall tower like they do now. The blades would ultimately grow to 50 or 75 feet long and open to an area about 4 feet wide. Now that's a lot of square footage being pushed by a 15 to 20 knot wind. The generator and controls would be located within the base of the four-legged support tower and would be protected from the elements by enclosing the base of the tower. Now during some other testing, I've noticed that the voltage output from the generator that's with no load connected seems to top out at around 36 or so volts. Even though a strong gust of wind has come along, which should have pushed the voltage even higher. This self-regulation is occurring because the blade panels can only flex open and close so fast before the whole blade set reaches what I call a terminal rotational velocity. Imagine that, a self-regulating turbine. You could eliminate stressing about caging the blades in very high winds. Also of note is the fact that vertical axis turbines don't have to face into the wind. Wind direction changes don't alter the speed or efficiency of the design. This design ro rotates at or slower than the wind, and it is known as a drag design. Basically, it's a low-speed, high-torque turbine that is totally quiet. The whole thing can be finished in a color other than white to match the surrounding landscape, eliminating the eyesore factor. Well we've kind of reached the point where the wind is slowing down a bit and in fact occasionally the uh, generator output drops below what the uh, battery's been charged up to so that accounts for some of the fluctuation on the meter especially when it shows zero watts being generated. So let's check the gauges, I mean the meters here for a minute. And uh, again, we see we're hovering around 12 volts, which is certainly not charging the battery because that needs to get up to 12 and a half volts. And the wind speed has dropped down below 
20. In fact, it's hovering down around 10 miles an hour now. And our lower right corner reading is typically zero watts, and that means nothing's going into the battery because the generator isn't uh, above 12 volts. Now the reading in the upper right corner of the uh, watt meter should be the same as the voltmeter attached to the uh, battery and it's running around 11.6 volts now it's sort of winding down to 11.6 volts so we didn't charge the battery all the way up to 12 and a half volts but we did get over a 2 volt increase in just a few minutes well here's how it works what I've done, I built a uh, prototype mock-up to uh, as sort of a teaching aid, and I've mounted two blades at uh, meeting at a 50 degree angle to illustrate the fact that if the wind on the downwind portion opens the blades just 15 degrees, they expand to a width of 20 inches on this mock-up which isn't a lot of flex but it does increase the exposed surface area quite dramatically now as that same blade rotates into the wind the blades will collapse and kind of form an aerodynamic shape and the overall surface ex exposure is now down to five inches so you can see it's roughly it quadruples the surface area as it goes downwind as opposed to what happens when it goes upwind and that's where you get I don't know roughly 75 percent efficiency as far as the winds interaction with the blades well there you have it if you're interested in the concept shoot me an email I've got a five page uh, more detailed explanation I can email back to you as an attachment. Thanks again for hanging in and watching.